Okay, Dave, we're ready when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Dave Zapponi, and I'm the Executive Director at ECHO, otherwise known as the Educational Council of Homeowners. We are based in San Jose with satellite offices in Tracy and Laguna Hills, California. Thank you for participating in the ECHO live stream event on preparation and response for HOAs to California wildfires, featuring Frank Yankee and Maria Newman. <clears throat> ECHO is a statewide nonprofit association created to support HOA board members and engaged homeowners. Our mission is to foster a better quality of life in community associations through education, advocacy, and connection. ECHO is 47 years old, which makes it the oldest association representing the collective interests of HOAs in the state of California. It prides itself on providing quality educational programs to build stronger communities. Before we, uh, before, before we move on with the program, please note the following. The webinar is scheduled for an hour and a half. Please feel free to leave the meeting at any time. Attendees will be muted during the presentation to help with sound quality and to assist the speaker in developing concepts. Please note that we will use the chat feature for technical issues and the Q&A feature for content related questions. You may ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature. We will be vetting and answering questions as they come in. Please note that we have more than 190 people <coughs> registered for this event, so we may not be able to answer all of you. Please be courteous and respectful to the meeting participants at all times. We reserve the right to mute or remove participants, remove participants at any time for any reason. This program is copyrighted by ECHO and will be recorded. We do not give permission to others to record the meeting without prior authorization. A copy of the recording along with the presentation slides will be emailed to registered participants within seven to 10 days. ECHO is a nonprofit corporation which has and strictly follows an antitrust policy. It is available for review on our website at www.echo-ca.org. And finally, none of what is being said during the meeting shall be construed as specific legal advice from either the speaker or ECHO. If you wish specific advice, we encourage you to ask your attorney. Thanks to our sponsors. Program sponsors, uh, registration sponsor and Q&A sponsors are the following. Fire and water damage recovery. Uh, additional program sponsors include Kevin Bolin, insurance agency with farmers and access construction. Thank you. Our Q&A sponsor is Levy Erlinger and Company, LLP, CPAs. At this time, we will hear a few words from our program sponsors. Fire and water damage recovery. Well, hi, I'm Maria. I'm the owner. Um, we're a women-owned business. We clean up anything disgusting. So fire, <laughs> smoke, water, um, sewage, the other day I had a customer call and say, we need you to move these people out. And we discovered that the person in that unit had um, passed away three weeks earlier and it wasn't really a moving job. You know, it was a trauma job. So if it's something that you don't want to talk about or, or discuss during lunch, that's probably something that we do. And um, we, unfortunately are the first responders after an emergency so if there was a fire we would come in we would get the um we would get the board up done we would get rid of the water we would get rid of the smoke we would do the first stage and then we would turn it over to a construction company to get you back to basics so this is our first webinar and i'm extremely nervous and i i hope my hair is okay <laughs> Frank, do you want to say something? Your, your hair is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah, Kevin uh, Boland from, uh, from Farmers Insurance Agency. 
Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Boland again, and I'm glad to be here. I want to thank Echo and David and Hannah in particular for putting on these educational panels. Like my granddad always said, there's no such thing as too much education. So thank you, everyone, for that. I've been a farmer's insurance agent for 21 years. My agency is located in downtown Novato, and I manage and I sell insurance for homeowner communities in California. And one of the things that I, I'm really happy to say is that farmer's insurance, as of today, is not non-renewing any HOA in California. And I've seen so many of these, um, you know, unfortunately independent brokers are out there scrambling to find carriers that are out of state. And farmer's insurance is domiciled in Southern California. And I think that makes a big difference. They're really committed to the HOA community. And I'm very proud about that. We also offer a guaranteed replacement cost policy in most cases for homeowners, which means no matter what the cost, farmer's insurance will pay every dollar to rebuild. And I think that's all I want to say. So thank you very much for being uh, here today. And I'm looking forward to learning with everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, the next is uh, Don Alonzo from Axis Construction. Hello, Don. Hi, thank you for having me. We're really excited to be a sponsor today. Um, a little bit about Axis Construction. We've been in business for over 29 years. and. We service the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we specialize in um, construction defect, anything with you know your balconies, your siding. Uh, we have an entire painting department. We have an electrical department, which I think that you'll find most construction companies shy away from. Um, but we really consider ourselves to be a, a full service contractor. And um, I've recently joined Axis, and I'm so excited to be part of the company because they're just, just ultimately good people, extremely honest, and um, you know we won't steer you wrong. So if you have any questions, I do have to jump off the call, but feel free to reach out to me, um, phone, text, um, you can email me, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you to all of our program sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, now with the program, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's presentation on preparation and response for HOAs to California wildfires. Frank Yankee, the, ge the general manager of fire and water damage recovery and is a graduate of Purdue University with 40 years experience in design and build construction. And we won't hold that against him since I'm from the University of Illinois. This, <laughs> this bore broad experience in many fields related to design, construction and maintenance and repair uniquely qualify him to consult on a board, broad range of industry related topics. Rescue dogs, he has three amazing dogs and they do everything together, even mascot the office. He is also the accidental experimental gardener. You never know what you will find growing in his nursery. Maria Newman is the owner of Fire and Water Damage Recovery. She was born in New York City. Uh, raised on the peninsula, she views her purpose in life to make the world be a better place. As such, she regularly volunteers and does the outreach for her company. Maria's work philosophy is all carrot and no stick. And since you, spend more, since you spend more time working than anything else, hire people that you like. She has a son who works for, at NASA, a daughter who works for, the for her church, and another son who is heading up sales division, uh, a sales division of 17. Someday she'll retire to a house in the Redwoods and write children's books but in the meantime, her workload, uh, her load, uh, she'll load up. In the meantime, her load up here. She likes to be busy. She's going to load up here, and she likes to be busy. Sorry, that's a little written wrong. So, uh, so anyway, there you go, Frank and Maria. The program's yours. Take care. Well, I'm very pleased to have been invited to participate here. This panel is unique to me that we are all a local community. These companies represent California residents and the community that we live in. Uh, we're not here to sell a product. We're not here to promote any special interest. We're all living in a, a very dangerous time. Whether 
you want to discuss the politics or the climate change or El Nino, the fact is we are living in a day where that video you saw at the introduction of the program is a reality to many of our residents, friends, and family members. So ECHO invited us to present a program that would be beneficial in real time for all of us that serve our community. That includes folks like the construction company, the insurance companies, the restoration companies, and you organizations that help communities evolve and protect themselves by doing routine maintenance, new construction and repairs. So as that goes, we will be focusing on wildfires, particularly today. What are the causes? How do they impact you directly? How do they impact you secondarily? And what you can do, first of all, to prepare should that catastrophe hit you and how to respond once you are in an event. So common causes of wildfire are on the slide here. My slides will have quite a few bullet points and pictures. I'm not gonna sit here and just read something that you can read later. Uh, Hannah will be forwarding you copies of this PowerPoint. It's also gonna be recorded. So you can read the fine detail later. I'll just have a running conversation with you. Maria will add some color and some stories and uh, she's mostly here for the entertainment value. I'm here for the technical value. Um, and Hannah's yeah, no pressure. I have to be entertaining. Thanks. Yeah, no juggling because the background doesn't work. Hannah's going to help drive the screen for us, so you may hear me interacting with her once in a while. Um, causes of wildfires. Some of them are pretty obvious. Uh, Hannah, if you could hit some of the hyperlinks, we'll show you a couple yep. of quick videos. No, it's still burning. Oh. Call 911. Call 911. Okay. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. All right. So, spooky stuff. If you uh, drive home today, take a look at all the overhead power lines. <laughs> along the road. Sorry, guys. Thank you, Hannah. I was going to have you do them back to back, but uh, I decided to interject a little bit. Uh, you take a look at the overhead lines. Take a look at the site conditions. See how many exposures there are. And um, I know a lot of people like to point fingers at utility providers for not doing adequate maintenance, but it really is a community effort. When you see on your private property or on your easement where there's an obstructed fire, a lot, a tree line near a power pole or something else, notify your utility provider in case their inspectors have missed it. It will help mitigate damage to your property and to your neighbors as well. We have a second video that's going to be an evolving light show from space on how lightning has actually reacted and started the wildfire. So pretty dramatic. That's our home right there on that picture. That's how engulfed we've been in this event. And we should anticipate that this is going to continue, not just throughout this season, but for the coming years. So as responsible holders of property and of properties that have citizens and, and people and families that live there, we need to find ways to plan to protect those human lives and when possible to protect that property so that our lives can get back to normal after catastrophes occur. 
Um, the one video I didn't have are some of the human caused. Those are more natural or utility related, but having things like smoking and sparklers during the 4th of July, having a vehicle with trailers having chains dragging, trucks that shed tires, um, cars that have mufflers that are dragging, that is not unusual to have fires started by humans near driving areas because most of the foliage is seasonally dry and it's easily transferred from one space into a wooded space. Let's move on to the next slide, Anna. So there are things that you can do if you own property to find out what level of risk your property is in. And uh, your HOAs, you may have multiple properties, you may have one campus area, you may only have one building. But the state itself, as we can see on this map, we have encountered more acres burned than any place else in the United States since 2002. And it's pretty heartbreaking because our state is beautiful and it's natural and the variety is remarkable, but it's being impacted. So on the next slide, this is a general map for history, but in real time, as you're experiencing life, she's gonna click on a hyperlink that this is an active California hazard severity zone viewer that you can zoom in from a real live map from the state of California that tells you at the current time what your hazard levels are. Later in this program, we'll talk about preventive planning and putting together procedures and processes to help protect residents and properties. And so what you can do is have someone auditing this site on a daily basis or based on a storm basis, and they may enact certain measures to help the residents communicate and prepare should they be headed for a lightning storm, a windstorm, a firestorm, anything else that's um, help you've anticipated happening and you have a response plan. Those links will be available in the copy of your program. So because we've grown as communities and we've spread out, a lot of us like to live in what's called the wildlife urban interface. You don't want to be a city player. You don't want to be a suburban. You really want to be out there in the woods and in the trees and you want to have a beautiful view of the bay or the, or the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the industry, as we've encouraged more and more of this in development, have called this the WUI or the UWUI as a nickname. But many of your properties may be in this type of environment. Next slide, please. As Kevin mentioned, um, some insurance companies are going to have a look at the risk of your property based on where you land in that map and what the proximity is and how much risk they're taking on taking on a policy for you. So as an HOA, I'm recommending you have a responsibility to do the following. Help your residents figure out escape routes to get out of the specific structures that they're in, in the case of any type of catastrophe. That could be an earthquake, fire, wind, um, power outage, uh, someone doing harm with a gun, for example. I know that's not public spaces, but if you have high density or if you have a lot of residents that you're managing, you need to anticipate some of the yucky things that happen in life and help escape plans for your people and communicate those clearly. So not only get them out of the residence, but if you're in a wildfire zone, how do you get them out of the zone? What are the arterial roads and accesses to get them from a red zone to a yellow zone perhaps? Or who is the incident commander with the fire division that you need to contact? Do they have a web portal or some sort of an a text alert that they can be sending you and or your residents. It's good in your plan to have prearranged alternative housing or to ask your residents to find friends or relatives so that when they're in crisis, there's some stability of where their destination is. <clears throat> it's as Maria mentioned, in advance of an emergency or catastrophe, get with professional responders and have them at the ready with either a master agreement 
or some sort of outlined contract that says, when we're in crisis, when we call you, you go. And we've already pre-agreed on having your insurance on file, that you're current with your licensing, that you know what our security accesses are, you know who to contact. That will help you tremendously in a crisis that you've never experienced before. Some security and some go-to people. As Maria mentioned, we do this every day, 365. So in your worst crisis is our normal day at work. And that's not to take it lightly. We respect you and we have a great deal of compassion for those of you going through these events. We would like you to advise to set up go bags and those things should include things like your medications, contact lists, copies of any of your, your very important papers or legal documents. Um, in Colorado, for example, it's actually a state requirement in fire districts. And if uh, you look, um, Hannah, is the exhibit going to be part of the email distribution packet later? Yes, it will. Okay, so this slide is the front cover sheet of a package of an 83 page pre planning document from an HOA about their community in a wildfire zone and what their response plan is to, to plan, to act, and to recover from a catastrophe. This exhibit will be distributed to you through email as some sort of a template you can use. You can hand it off to a consultant or you yourself can try to emulate this type of work. But this particular plan is very comprehensive, very well done, and I would recommend you all spin through it and take the best that you can out of it. Hey, Frank, you jumped over something. Um, one of the things that we recommend is a lot of times we're doing the contents and we're asked to do a total loss inventory and we don't recognize what something is. If you stand in the middle of the room, in each room of your house, and you do a video of each room, and you had a fire where your house burned down, you could do a total, we could do a total loss inventory for you, and you could fill it in. So you could say, oh yeah, that's the couch I bought from Macy's for $480. That's the picture frame that's irreplaceable because it goes back to 1912. So, that kind of information, you know, you, you don't want to go to the trouble of writing an inventory of what's in every room today because you'll be up all night. But if you have a online video of every room, then when I call, you know, Allstate and make an inventory for them, you can fix it and it's real, not fast, but doable. Not Allstate. Farmers, sorry, farmers. <laughs> okay, Hannah, let's move forward. So what you want to do is get with someone like Kevin and talk about what are the elements involved in mm -hmm. having a loss and make sure that that data is communicated with that agent so that your policy clearly represents all of the elements that are of value to you. And a lot of them you may not realize. Things like um, your outbuildings or if you've done an addition or if you added solar panels. If you haven't updated your insurance carrier, the likelihood of it is being covered, it's probably not fair to ask them to cover a barn that they never knew existed when you were paying your premiums every month for the last two years. So as Maria says, when you take this video, it may clue you in to, to let your insurance agent know, you know what, we've added some new leather furniture and some new TVs. I bet our contents needs to be reevaluated and someone like Kevin needs to take a look at this. Kevin, you wanna add any comments to that? Yeah, I sure do. So I guess the only one point I think that's um, the most important one and that I see that most people that live in a, a condominium, um, they are underinsured on is what's called the building or the dwelling coverage in your HO6 policy. HO6 is just the insurance company's term for a condominium policy. So if you live in a condominium and your CCNRs say that the master insurance policy will only pay for the, everything that's outside of your condo and you are responsible for everything inside of your condo, 
what that means is you have to have money in your HO6, your individual homeowner insurance policy for the kitchen cabinets, the kitchen countertops, the kitchen flooring, all the bathrooms, the vanities, all the flooring in, throughout the entire home, uh, the hot water heater, the furnace, and even painting your home after a fire. So my recommendation to everyone is always call your broker and ask them, do I have building and dwelling coverage in my HO6 policy? That's number one. Number two, find out from your board whether or not the master policy will pay for the interior building components or not. And that one particular point is the only one I want to address because I think it's the most important. And um, I'm actually about to submit an article to David for his review and hopefully he'll approve it and it might be, have a chance of getting out there on the uh, Echo Journal or on the website. And I talk about the five most important coverages every condominium owner has to have. And um, that to me is the most important and the one area that most condominium owners are underinsured on. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we find that people are usually underinsured for contents because they think contents is, you know, if I have $25,000 worth of stuff, I have $25,000 worth of insurance, but the insurance pays for me, the restoration contractor to go in and make a list of everything that you have. And it also pays for you to stay in a hotel while the thing gets redone. And by the time you're, you've maxed out your policy, there's nothing left over for your actual contents. Yeah, yeah, that's so a great point. You have point. to know what you're paying for. And um, Frank and I recommend, if you can have the master policy and the individual policies all written by the same person, it helps A, if you have a fire, because it's not, you don't have two insurance companies fighting about whose responsibility it is to go back and forth. And B, you don't have um, holes in the policy where wait, nobody's, nobody's handling this dishwasher, right? So um, I don't know that you can ask people to all be with one insurance carrier, but I definitely think you should recommend it. Yeah, let's move ahead. So as Kevin mentioned, here's the two different types of policies that you'll be dealing with in, in our business that we're discussing today. The HOA master policy, which covers, um, you can read all the bullets, but it's the property itself. It's the structure proper. It's the building envelope of the structure. That would be siding, windows, roofing, common areas. And as Kevin described, depending on your agreement, sometimes they cover the stud that your wall covers to the exterior of the hallway to a common area, but all the interior walls may be yours. All the interior drywall may be yours on the HO6. So if you get the same insurance company with the same insurance agent who clearly knows the definition, everyone gets made whole here and feels that they've responsible coverage. There's no right answer. It's up to each team of residents and HOA boards to decide what's the right solution for them. And a lot of that's based on scale. If you've got an enormous property with grand landscape to deal with, you may want to defer costs to the individual residents to cover more of their interior costs while the HOA bears the burden of a lot of re-roofing, maybe shared HVAC units that have common exhaust ducts, that sort of thing. Kevin, do you want to add more about these two? Yeah, could I jump in there real quick? Yep. Please do. So after the glass fire we just had last month, um, and HOA, who's now my new client, I wasn't there insured before, they um, suffered a million dollar claim. One of their properties was completely destroyed by uh, the wildfire. And all the coverages were pretty much in place, which was good to know and see. However, the, um, the fire spread across Highway 12 and came onto their property and it destroyed lots of grass, lots of bushes, and even a couple of trees. And when the adjuster came out, he, he talked to the, uh, the manager, who's been, she's been doing a wonderful job. She's really sharp and jumping on everything amazing. Here, how much coverage do I have? And the adjuster had the policy right in the palm of his hand, because that's what they do. Oh, you only have $5,000 for that. Yikes. So my one point for sharing this story with you today 
make sure you don't overlook your landscaping coverage because after the fire occurs, the fire, to, the fire can actually wipe out a good deal of landscaping. I have an HOA in Windsor. We just increased our landscaping to a half a million because it's over 300 homes and they have a lot of beautiful landscaping. So don't overlook that part of your, um, your HOA master policy coverage. And it doesn't cost much to bump it up. And that's good news too. Good, Kevin, thank you. So another point Kevin touched on earlier is replacement cost. So when you get your initial policy written, Kevin can look at an appraisal or he might have his own resources to find out what the current values are for both the HOA master policy and for each individual unit, but those are gonna evolve over time. Um, I'm not a big fan of auto renew. I think every time you make any significant renovations or changes to your property, as well as annually, that you meet again with Kevin or your agent to review your policy. If, if you're now getting taxed because there's escalated costs and values in the region, you need to proportionally increase your coverages. Now, Farmers happens to be very progressive in selling policies that give you full replacement cost instead of making you pay an extra for it or it's something they try to slip in the exclusions. And we have a lot of our clients struggle with the fact that they've been living in the house for 30 years and I've been insured and paying my premiums for 30 years and they're only going to pay for half of my house. And they look to us for solutions as the emergency responder and we can't have them get a time machine and go back and reassess value. So sadly, people who have earned great value and appreciation now end up losing maybe retirement or their nest egg because they didn't keep maintaining their policy. So one last call to Kevin before we switch slides to re reinforce that. Um, sure, you know, you, there's, um, what I can say is that about 80 or 90% of the homeowner associations that I insure and that other are insured by farmers today, we can actually offer you a guaranteed replacement cost policy. And the guarantee means no matter what the cost, farmers insurance will pay to rebuild it. What's really great is farmers offers that uh, policy, as Frank said earlier, at really no additional cost. And that's amazing because I've seen other companies from out of state try to offer the guaranteed replacement cost policy but it's like twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 higher. So that's one benefit to have it. So if you can get the guarantee, get it. If you're in the WUI area, however, it's becoming more difficult to offer that type of policy. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Depends on what your fire line score is. If you're under about a three, I could probably get you that policy, but if you're over that, it's hard. We can still give you extra money to rebuild, um, and we know how to do that at Farmers, but um, you just, of the one thing you want to really make sure that um, when you're on the board, it's very, very critical to have enough money in that policy to rebuild. And like my grandfather always said, a little more is always better, Kevin, than a little less of almost everything. So <laughs> thank you, Frank. You're welcome. So Kevin is actually, his answers are very responsible in the fact that he's speaking from the chair of a farmer's agent that walks the talk. There are a couple other good quality insurance companies. So just that we happen to be dropping his name a few times doesn't mean that he's the only guy and it's your due diligence to discuss with other policy providers what they may or may not be able to do for you. And I'm sure Kevin would not mind having you do comparative shopping because it oftentimes will just reinforce to you that Kevin did cover you with the right quote and with the right amount of exclusions and qualifications or you might find out that just this year, somebody else is in the game and they provide a good policy at a good price and Kevin will shake their hand and say, I'll see you again next year. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, slide to the next slide there, Hannah. So in addition to once you've discussed your policy and you've established the guidelines, you also need then to understand what the process is in time for a claim. You're gonna to need to pay your premiums. You're gonna to need to renew your policy. You're gonna have limits that you need to understand and agree are acceptable. You need to discuss the deductibles. And we could probably spend an hour talking about the give and take of how do you decide where the diminishing return of deductible versus coverage is. Uh, I believe some insurance companies 
will exclude you. You know, Maria, do you want to talk about the quantity versus well, I'm not, the magnitude? I was told early on it's the amount of claims, not the number of claims. You need to find out from your insurance company. Um, we've had customers who have $500 deductibles and they insist on making $645 claims. And they get non-renewed after two claims. And we've had customers with $100,000 claims that get renewed because they don't only have one claim. So you need to be careful when you, um, when you put a claim out that you're actually needed. I personally for myself always have the highest deductible of back because I don't want to have a large number of claims. I also happen to own a restoration company. So, you know, I can send my guys over to clean up sewage. But if you have a $500 deductible, you don't want to have three $800 claims. That's not going to behoove you, but we can move on. That's just um, make sure you're watching your number of claims as opposed to the amount of your claims. That's a good point. Thank you very much. So we've got wildfires, we've got soot flying around in the air, we have ash, but a couple of the most consequential secondary effects of wildfire is the firefighters efforts to put the fire out usually include a heck of a lot of water. And that water is not always being applied naturally. It can be dropped from a helicopter. It can be pumped by fire trucks. So you are going to get mud flow from that excessive water that's going to either overload the civil engineer's drain system, or if you're in an urban area where there was no underground storm system, it's all surface, you're going to get retention ponds and you're going to get dams that burst and curbs that get overflowed. You're going to get mud slides and mud flow. You may even get trees moving that wouldn't have moved otherwise. We um, once had a job where a guy had five million dollars worth of electronics in his basement. He had a home studio. He had, um, I mean, you know, Los Altos Hills and the whole basement filled with mud. He had mud in his elevator. Yeah, he had an elevator in his house. <laughs> and he didn't think through that the fire from the previous year, he had to build a retaining wall against. So I don't, I mean, the insurance company did cover it, but he lost his $5 million worth of um, electronics. And I think we were there for a month or two pumping mud out. So you have to look at, you know, time versus, I mean, he had to build a retaining wall eventually anyway keep it from happening again. So you have to look at after a wildfire, do you, have, do you now have a wall of mud that's waiting for the first rainstorm? So either you have the direct effect of the water or the mud intruding on your space, or it may be a delayed response that isn't really, the, the same day of the fire, you're not gonna get the mudslide. When those trees die and the roots die, and the stability of a hill is weakened, you can have a mudslide six months later, and there's a thing called the proximate cause doctrine that gives you the right to go back to your insurance company and discuss, we believe that this mudslide was caused by the fire six months ago. You're gonna probably need some expert witnesses or public authorities to help um, to prove and to qualify that Kevin, do you have any experience in this and how we can advise these listeners? Yeah, it's a good question. I've never actually had a client <clears throat> that had to go back and get coverage under their policy you know, for that specific reason where there was a mudslide, because normally that is a peril that is excluded under all homeowner association policies as well as individual owners policies too. Um, I think you could definitely make that argument. And I think it makes a lot of sense to me the longer time period from the date of the, the fire to when initially the undergrowth was taken away and then all of a sudden the mudslide occurred, the longer that time period, obviously the more difficult it might be to prove it. Um, but I think it's, you know, you get yourself a good strong attorney that's smart. Um, why not give it a shot and, and see if you can get coverage under there. So, and 
I don't know the right answer, but if you can discuss this issue with your agent as you're writing your policy, because if it's flat out in the exclusions, you've got quite a battle on your hands. And if you, if you know the property that you're owning is in a very hilly area, that's a very wooded, that this is a probable event that's going to happen in the event of a wildfire. And it's best to address it before you write the policy and accept all the exclusions than after. Okay, Hannah, let's move on. So uh, Kevin mentioned some inf insurers are flat out refusing to provide policy in certain areas that are affected by wildfire routinely over and over again. Um, and the companies that you were insured with may not renew you even if you didn't file a claim because the risk of that region has gone higher and higher. Next slide. So the government does, of California provides some sort of a safety net for you called the California Fair Plan, but it's extremely high cost and it's not nearly as luxurious as most of your policies are in covering incidentals and specific things that you'd like to have in an insurance company. You can get supplemental insurance to that fair plan. These gap policies are difficult to find and pretty expensive. There are also companies that are still insuring in those high risk areas. As Kevin mentioned with farmers, they're not exiting the market. They have been there to serve that community and they plan on maintaining that relationship. Next slide. So as part of the HOA and your residence, we've talked about all those yucky parts of it. So let's talk about what we can do to keep ourselves minimized and from the exposure of wildfire, both directly impacting our properties and indirectly. Uh, the bullet points there are items that should be in your covenants and your rules and conditions for your HOA. You might want to exclude outdoor grills, wood burning fireplaces. You might have special zero scape that has very little lawn. You want to examine your landscape materials as well as their spacings. Um, you might have to schedule pruning and maintenance into your HOA budget. You may want to bury your main power lines in lieu of having overhead service that is a pretty high expensive one, but oftentimes, Kevin, I don't know if when you folks evaluate a property, if you factor in any of these bullet point elements in, in the actuary selecting how much risk and, and price of each policy is going to be. Well, yeah, every insurance company will typically have a question on the application when I submit it. And that question will say, are the residents of a homeowner association allowed to have a um, barbecue on their on their wooden patio or wooden deck? So I always have to check with the manager to see what the policy is. Fortunately, in Northern California, we have a very active um, management community, and they're very good about telling all the um, the boards of directors, "Hey, do not allow anybody to barbecue on a deck," and and that's something that uh, I'm really happy about. And the California Fire Code actually says today, if you're in a homeowner association community, you should really, you're not really allowed to have a propane tank that's over two and a half pounds in capacity. So those big 15 gallon tanks that we all used to use for our Webers really have to be a thing of the past. So um, I think, um, yeah, I think that um, that answers the question, I hope. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Thank you. Go. Oh, Frank, Frank. Um, I see in the the, um, the Q and A that they want to know about single homes, and to a large degree, the information is the same. I I have a house, mm -hmm. and down the house is, down the hill from my house is a grove of eucalyptus trees, and between the eucalyptus trees, which by the way are filled with oil and they explode and they're terrible trees, and nobody should ever have a eucalyptus tree anywhere near a residential neighborhood, there's dried grass. So from the moment that grass got dried until it got cut down, I called the fire department and I called the fire department and I called the fire department and I found the right person at the fire department to get my neighbor to clean and cut that dried grass. So when the eucalyptus trees caught fire, they didn't catch the dry grass on and then go up the hill to my house. And then around my house, 
I have my accidental gardener um, planting green, green, green stuff. There's no trees overhanging. It's the same for a condo as for a house. You have to take responsibility for the area around you because you can't trust your neighbors. I have another neighbor who has kindling. He's got all the old, um, he, he groomed his trees and he just left, he just left dried sticks and leaves underneath his house. And, you know, you have to, you have to take your own responsibility because there's nothing that I can do as his neighbor other than to point out that he has kindling under his house to help people who don't think. There, that's my, my two cents. Go. go. Okay. So um, the inter interchange between Maria and I, as you can see, we work together very closely, routinely all the time. Our personalities complement one to another. And I, I believe I misspoke early in the introduction when I may have played down Maria's importance as being the entertainment. What I meant to say is she adds color and reality at 18 years of experience of running this sort of a business. And uh, the entertainment value is I'm boring and telling you technical stuff and she's bringing the real life experiences that are going to grab you and get your attention. So I apologize. No pressure there. Okay. That was but a good no, I, I, did, I did not mean it to be a downplay. It was more the fact that she's been in this business. She is the, the name of the business. She owns the business. And this she is expert at this. She's delegated the blocking and tackling portions to me so that she can do primarily marketing and customer relationships. Um, and so just use the wrong choice of words when we introduced each other. Apologize for that. All right. So, um, so somebody asked how a wood burning fireplace is a risk in a wildfire, Frank. I believe that my personal opinion is if you have a property, whether you're an HOA or an individual homeowner, you should disable your wood burning fireplace in California. It's, it's very beautiful and it smells nice and it's very historic and nostalgic. But the fact is, even with a spark arrestor on your flu, you are gonna discharge heat and pollution and embers into the atmosphere. And with all the other wildfires and pollution issues we have, there's no reason to take the risk. There are some very good quality supplemental inserts you can replace them with. We happen to have a gas fired insert that generates heat, it gives the illusion and it has a real fire, but it's in a combustion chamber that's controlled. All we exit is some carbon monoxide gas. It circulates the heat through the house with a low voltage um, fan that runs off of our solar electrical collector. Okay, Frank, so, Frank, 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 you missed the question. The question is how is a wood burning fireplace a risk in a wildfire? It's not a risk, it can cause wildfire is what we were trying to say. It's another way a fire can be started, but it doesn't actually make a wildfire worse. Does that make sense? What it, what it does do is it introduces a new way for your home to stoke the fire if the fire hits your house. We'll see some pictures later on that show when a fire starts, it starts usually down in the grass and heat rises. That Rising heat is called stratification. It's what happens in the atmosphere all the time. So as that heat rises, it carries embers and coals with it. And if that air is forced into small spaces, it now accelerates its velocity. So through your eave lines and your vents and your flues, if there's a fire in your structure and you've got this vent that's going to accelerate the airflow through it, you're going to actually stoke that fire. It's like having a carburetor on your your um, gas fired camp light or your barbecue where you choke the air on and off. If you have an open fire fireplace that's a wood burning fireplace and there's a fire in your home, it will increase the chance of damage significantly. Does that answer the question? All right, keep going. Okay. 
So you want to do a preliminary expense in inspection, and there are plenty of public officials that would love to get invitations from folks like you to walk their property and help analyze what you can do to improve and minimize your risk. There's the fire marshal, there's CAL FIRE, there are local representatives, your insurance provider, I'm sure have consultants as well as agents that can assist. And also your utility providers have a great vested interest in making sure your property is as immunized as possible from damage because as we've seen, a lot of damages get linked back to the utility providers as the source. And if you can work in cooperation with them to minimize their risk, they have consultants at your beck and call to come out and look at your systems together with you. However, Robert here in the chat says that he's been trying to get them to come out for three years. So all I can say is I nagged my guy until they came out. <laughs> You can give your guy's number to Maria because she's persistent. <laughs> I, I apologize that they're not responding to you. That's that, that very much hurts my feelings that um, we're promoting most of these folks that do a responsible <laughs> job and you're in a region that doesn't seem to be giving you the attention you need. Anna? All right, so there are many formulas about making your structure safe, about the types of landscape that you have, the proximity of certain combustibles, the regions for protection and how intense you need to be with each region. This is just a, a Truckee Fire Department recommendation. You would probably want to look at your local fire marshal and ask him for their advice because the types of trees and the types of terrain, whether you're hilly or you're flat, or you're in a high wind, you may have different conditions they recommend. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, FEMA is a federal authority and they have quite a bit of data. The link there goes to an 80 page plus FEMA wildfire preparation workbook that goes into ex exhausting detail level. And if you wanna to flip to the next page there, Anna, uh, there are three zones of protection that they define for you. The first zone is within thir the first 30 feet of your structure or your facility if you've got multiple buildings. Um, and it varies depending on if you're on a hillside or if you're in an urban area or a wooded area. If you clip to the next slide. Obvi I'm obviously, we're not gonna read all those buttons. There's lots and lots of things that they want you to look through during not just your initial inspection, but to do routine inspection and maintenance about to keep maintaining your fire resistance and your protection. And in zone two, which is from the 30 to 100 feet, there's a lot less things to be as concerned about because if you've done a good job in the first 30 feet, then your house or your structure is a lot less exposed to these few issues. Hannah, if you want to click next. Um, we're down to four or five bullet points of things to be really concerned about. And then zone three is your far perimeter, and that's from 100 to 200 feet. So unless you're on a multi-acre facility with hundreds of residents and you're running one HOA, this is a good guideline for you smaller HOAs with a single building or two, or if you've got houses in a residential <clears throat> assembly, it's sort of like a suburb or um, a neighborhood, you would want to have a combined zone review with those residents. Can I Again, jump in another, and uh, quick? Oh, sorry. Sure, Kevin, go ahead. So I actually, I am now serving as the president of my association and we have 214 homes in Novato. And one of the, one of the epiphanies I made this year was I took a walk around with our landscaper and there was actually little pockets of, of areas around our homes that still had a tremendous amount of fuel and a tremendous amount of slope. And when you, when the insurance company determines your fire line score, which determines your rates, of course, we're going to non-renew, they look at the fire line score. So the only thing I wanted to say was it's really, if you're on the board, uh, take a good walk around your homeowner association, identify those areas that are high in fuel and high in slope and get rid of them. My association, I think we spent over $200,000 this year so far, making our, our HOA more uh, fire defensible. 
And, and the other point that I'll quickly make is that when you walk around with your landscaper, which again, an epiphany for me, is that we identified some areas that really didn't need to be addressed right away. So we didn't really have to spend more. Um, and as many of the board members that are veterans will know, it's always important, even with your best vendors, to do a walk around, to really micromanage them, to make sure that you know every dollar that you're paying is getting used in the best way for the association. And as a board member, I think only us, because we live in our community, have as much passion and care as much about our community than anybody else. I like that you there, Kevin. An HOA is not an adversary to the residents. They're an advocate. And it's not a for-profit agency. The only reason the HOA exists is so that a community co-op can succeed together as a partner. So doing these inspections, and, and you know, Kevin proudly said they spent $200,000. Well, I'm sure there's one or two residents that are going, why is my HOA spending $200,000 when we could be putting in new streets for that? But the fact is communication is important. So if Kevin comes up with this study and says there's this fuel in this area that needs to be addressed and it's going to cost $30,000 and we've got three competitive bids on it, he can also explain if we do not address these, our insurance rating will go up, our risk will go up, the opportunity that you're going to lose your residence and be impacted by a catastrophe goes up. And it can also help you budget for the upcoming year's HOA fees and rates. So you can responsibly adjust accordingly. Right, Kevin? Yeah, we had a few homeowners um, that just moved in and they were kept asking me, How do, why don't we install a hot tub? How about a hot tub or a big spa? So I said, well, do you want to have a hot fire here? Or do you want to have a hot tub? <laughs> and that put an end to the conversation. So yeah, it's a matter of priorities. Good for you. Okay, now let's move on. So what else can you do? Um, some of you banded a bunch of residences together and made an HOA like Kevin of residential single family houses. Some of you managed condominium buildings or multiple buildings of condos or multiple high density residential that have multi-story condos. Whether you have an existing building or a new building, you should always keep in mind, what can I continue to do as my building evolves to improve its defensibility and its resistance to wildfire and damage? And I am going to read some of these bullets and explain in detail. So there are fire retardant construction materials that have evolved over time that have a very good application in California these days. The most important would be your roofing, because when fire spreads, it's usually when that plume of warm air I talked about stratifies ash and, and sparks and other debris into the medium atmosphere and it floats to the neighbors and these cinders drop into your rooftop or into your gutters or into your landscape and then they spread the fire. If you've used a non-combustible or a fire retardant roofing or siding or landscape, the chances of that fire spreading your way are significantly decreased. And it will also help the firefighters then control the areas that they don't have a defense line on. Um, we talked about fireplaces a few minutes ago. I'm not going to reiterate that. Smart homes are a unique evolution in science that I don't know if the insurance industry is caught up with yet, but I certainly have. If you've got a smart thermostat that connects to your iPhone, or to your car or to your appliances. There's actually some really good stuff that you can do that's more productive than how many times did my kids get ice cream last week. Your Nest thermostat can be inter intertied with your fire and your smoke alarms. So even if you're not home, it can notify you. If you've seen a wire fire warning and you're in San Francisco, but your home is in Napa and you're now getting smoke inside of your home, your Nest thermostat communicating with your smoke alarms can text you or call you. And then remotely, if you'd like, you can turn off your HVAC system's outside air fan so you're not drawing air and smoke and soot into your home and adding damage that would not necessarily be there. You might also have some other electrical devices you can disable. Some people put electric solenoid valves on gas lines at the, at the gas main so that they can remotely shut those off so that should there be a fire at their home, 
it won't be exacerbated by having natural gas or a propane line feeding that flame or exploding it. And it's also important for um, earthquakes. Yeah, true. M more catastrophes than we're talking about today could benefit from those sort of things. Yeah. Uh, sprinkler also, systems. Okay. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I recommend hardy plank too. Whenever you can replace the wood siding of T111, which goes up like a matchbook, um, try to put, if the budget allows, of course, hardy plank. I was out at a customer's home and he was a contractor. He put hardy plank everywhere. And what that will do, it'll slow the fire down by about an hour. So it gives the fire department more time to get to your property. Again, it is more expensive, but in the long term, it's a great way to keep your, your homeowner association you know, more fire resistant. Oh, one other point too. There's a, there's a Firewise USA uh, nonprofit organization out there that is really great. They'll show you and they'll walk through all the steps that it takes to make your HOA even safer. And I know probably a lot of board, member, board members already know about this, but in case anybody doesn't, contact your local fire department and they'll come out and work with the uh, Firewise USA team. And we did that um, in the last year with a couple of our clients. A lot of uh, good managers, and we have a lot of great managers in Northern California. They're very good about making sure that um, their communities become Firewise USA. And once you get that designation, I can take that back as well as any other insurance broker and help to negotiate a better rate because it shows that the board is a Firewise USA community today and they've been really proactive. So that, I think that's a really smart thing to do. I just wanted to put in a plug for Firewise USA because they really support um, the homeowner associations in California. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of things to Frank. Um, Bruce says to stress the importance of closing all the windows when a fire is in the area to keep embers from coming inside and igniting curtains. Many homes burn from the inside. That makes sense. And then, um, uh, let me see, Dan said, is there any type of fire retardant application available to existing roofing? So when you get to the roofing, is that the next slide? It's coming up shortly. I'm doing okay. some more expanded so we'll definitions on roofing and siding. Um, you can, if you're not building new structures, you can retrofit fire sprinkler systems in existing structures. It's completely feasible these days. There are flexible polyethylene pipe systems that can be fished through walls that's very non-invasive and is very effective cost-wise to put in both new construction and retrofit. And I'm sure Kevin can tell you that's a significant checklist item for the insurance adjuster to, or you know, appraiser to look at when they're identifying how risky your home is. Uh, well, that'll give in, you, yeah. So with all, with all insurance companies, if you have a sprinkler system, that'll give you about a 15% discount off the overall premium. So that's just for an interior sprinkler. And if you're in one of these urban zones that's at risk for wildfire, you can actually protect and, and have a barricade of up to 15 to 30 feet from that fire system to the exterior of your home. The challenge I had years ago, I designed and built myself a home in the Emerald Hills of Redwood City, and I had designed a sprinkler system for it. I went in for permits, got all approved. I started construction and I just happened to ask the fire department to do a static and residual flow test on the, on the hydrant, hydrant that was on my street. And I found out there was not enough water flow nor pressure to even activate my system. So I had to withdraw my permit for my sprinkler system because it would have sat idle and the utility provider was not gonna upgrade their pumps and systems just to satisfy protecting my property. So it was a, a chicken before the egg thing. Who's gonna invest first? But in your community, it's pretty easy to get a, just a phone call into the fire department, give them your address or the closest cross street. They can let you know what the static and residual pressures are. And you can have a sprinkler design build contractor tell you right away if that's sufficient enough to add a system for you. <clears throat> um, we all have mentioned landscaping we should probably get with a landscape professional to evaluate your property and what you can do to minimize risk there, as well as just do routine maintenance for sure. Hey, Frank, uh, Hannah says we gotta hurry. All right, next. <laughs> uh, so there are the fire retardant materials. For 
replacement or for new construction, almost in order here, you want to have masonry or solid block. You want to use stucco or concrete. There's extruded form called EFS, and it's a multi-layer system. It's a lot like stucco, but it's got better insulation value and better fire rating. Uh, there are composite boards like Hardy board that Kevin was talking about that are manufactured, but very fire resistant and economical. And you can use vinyl or metal siding, which is a little old school, but it's still a lot better than wood siding. Next slide. Um, these are some physical examples of some of those sidings applied. They can still be aesthetically good looking. It's not like you're having to, to look like you're living in a housing project and still be safe. You can still be very appealing. Next one. So there are here some retardant roof materials, clay tile, slate tile, concrete tile, metal roofing. I don't know if there are any specific products you can put on asphalt tab type roofing or shingle roofing that you have now that would add a responsible fire layer without voiding the warranty of the original product or that the insurance industry recognizes as an additive. I can do some additional research and I will get that data back to ECHO to see if there's an aftermarket product to add to those type products. But I think because they're mostly petroleum based or actually wood, it's gonna be really hard to protect them. Next slide. Uh, in new construction, the, the wildfire resistant building envelope is generally a little more economical than buying all sorts of fancy imported woods and trims and mixing and matching things. And so there really is no negative reason why you shouldn't design or do retrofits or repair if you have to have an event with more wildfire resistant <coughs> exterior to your building. Next slide. Frank? Yes, so Kevin. So in, in the Tubbs fire in 2017, we lost a 46 um, homeowner association. Every home was gone, the, the foundations were gone and they rebuilt their entire OHOA today. It's all metal and they're very happy with it. <laughs> Next slide, please. So there is a premium cost on the roofing, but one thing to note about the additional roofing is there's a, there's a lot of aesthetic appeal to these alternative type roofs that make them look higher end. They also usually have a longer warranty than a standard asphalt tab roof would only have 10, 15 year warranty. Most of these manufactured fire resistant roofing will have up to 30 years of warranty on them. So it's a good investment for the HOA and for the homeowners. And they're also uh, water resistant too, compared to the wood underneath uh, for the asphalt. All right, Frank, okay. Frank, we're past time here, so. Okay, skip the slide. Hannah, move ahead. We already talked a little bit about some of the actions of the flames. Next slide. Um, Hannah, what would you like us to do on the part about actually processing a claim? Were they just going to let the uh, attendees read the rest of the slides and get with their agent to find out how to process a claim? Um, I think it's okay if we can get through the next, um, the last few slides here um, in about five minutes. I think we're good to go. So you still got a little bit of time and leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Great. So if you've worked in advance to make a, a, a catastrophe response plan and you and your agent and your residents have a unified insurance response, there will be a checklist of the easy steps on what to do to make your fire claim. Hit the next slide. Anna, if you could. Um, the biggest pain about having one of these events is your whole life is turned upside down. And the more pre-planning you could do to get yourself back to normal, the less dramatic it's going to be. So the pre-planning is a really good investment so that everyone comes through this thing whole. We as emergency providers know every day our goal and what makes us proud of what we do is to take people who are in agony and at the lowest point that they could possibly be and try to get they and their families stable again. Next slide. Now, this is pretty important. If your house isn't actually struck by the fire, there are significant things that can affect your property 
that you need to discuss with your insurance agent and or adjuster that may relate to damage to your property or HOA, even if there's a fire in one unit and seven unaffected units, there could be smoke and staining, soot, ash, and contamination of insulation in common spaces, HVA systems, all the other stuff on my, our buttons here need to be addressed. And again, reported in a timely fashion to your insurance provider so that you can start negotiating whether they agree, disagree, or if you have to bring in some professionals to evaluate and test and measure those things. Um, quick, quick, one quick point. So, I'm oh, sorry. So, you know, smoke is actually one of the 20 covered perils under a homeowner insurance policy. So even if you don't see visible damage of smoke or ash on your property, we had nine of our homeowners, two of them in HOAs, said, you know what, I can really smell the smoke inside our home. So um, our company and any good insurance company will send out somebody to get rid of that odor for you. So don't hesitate to make that call. And it's considered a non-fault loss that so will not raise your rates either. And just so you know, there's lots of insurance companies right now in the fire district um, who are denying claims. So uh, a good remediation company will provide you with the documentation you need for your claims. And also if your insurance company is being buttheads, I think that's the correct technical term. Um, they will um, tell you how to go about getting a claim done if you need one. But obviously the best thing to do is to not have one in the first place. So that's what we hope we've um, hit on hardest is avoiding it in the first place. Are we done? Next slide, Anna. Yeah, done. Look at that, only two minutes over. Thank you, Anna, great management. Thank you guys, thank you, Maria, thank you, Frank. So we're gonna move on to the Q&A um, portion of this webinar. So we have some questions in the Q&A and I'll go ahead and read them aloud and um, have our speakers answer them. I'd like to thank our sponsors for the Q&A session, Fire and Water Damage Recovery and Levy Erlinger and Company. So one of the questions that I received was, so Maria, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned a homeowner standing in their home and um, taking videos of um, their belongings. Um, how often would you say that that needs to be done? Good question. Um, I am not a shopper and I don't add anything to my house. So um, other than, yeah, I mean, I probably can do it once a year. And I don't have very high coverage of my stuff in my house because I don't, that's not something I don't, I don't buy expensive art. Um, I spend most of my money on food. Um, I like to eat at nice restaurants and I don't know any insurance company that's going to, um, you know, reimburse me for a really nice meal. So um, it depends on what you do. If you go out and you buy a Monet, I would probably make sure that that gets documented. But if you go and you buy yourself, you know, $25 pictures off of eBay, you don't need to redo it. Okay. Um, we have another question here. So regarding redwood fencing, is it fire safe and are there alternatives? So redwood is like any other fuel at a certain temperature, it is going to light fire. There are retardants you can put in them. There are stains and finishes, but the fact is using an alternative material that's metal or has a much higher temperature to combustion ratio is a better product to use for fencing. Okay, thank you. Um, so is there any help that these homeowners could possibly get from the city that they live in? Is there any resources that you guys are familiar with or have had experience with? Uh, Susan Piper seems to have something to say here. Sure, um, would you like to um, uh, mention that? Um, wanna, yeah, wanna... I can go ahead and read it. Um, she says, for dealing with insurance, visit uphelp.org, a consumer nonprofit that helps disaster survivors work with their insurance companies following, which, following a disaster. They have a good checklist of what to do in advance, yes, pre-planning, but also a step-by-step after a disaster. 
you can see what they're doing in Northern California with their roadmap to recovery. So thank you so much for that, Susan. And again, that website that she recommended was uphelp.org, U-P-H-E-L-P.org. And as far as I'm concerned, I would always turn to your local fire marshal as your first resource for advice on planning and response and measuring types of equipment, whether it's fencing or it's decking or it's your house itself. That's what they're trained to do. That's what their lives goal is, is to protect you citizens. Their job number one is to protect people. Property and investments and livestock and everything else are way down on the priority list than saving people. Um, she also, Susan also pointed out there's something called www.readyforwildfire.org from Cal Fire that she likes. Mm -hmm. um, vents in the foundation or under the eaves need to have an eight inch wire mesh to keep embers from getting in. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up on the top of Skyline Boulevard um, and we had a fire that was caused from, um, they had a outdoor campfire and the way redwood trees work, the campfire hit a root and it went down the root and up the tree and exploded the tree three days later. So mm -hmm. you can't wow. have a campfire in um, a redwood tree grove for that reason, because it will sit there and wait. Um, and I mean, you know, there's just certain things that only, you only know if you live there. You only know if you grew up in that area. And I'm sure that the fire districts know this kind of information. So to, to piggyback on what Frank said too, I don't know if it's true for all fire departments, but in Novato, I discovered that the, um, our fire department would actually reimburse our association any type of expen expenditure that we did paid for to make our HOA more fire resistant. So we got a check last month for $1,500 for our HOA, which was great. And it also applies, at least in Novato, to single family homeowners. So if you do work around your property, the, uh, the department, the fire department in Novato will be able to reimburse you up to $500. But you make sure you call them ahead of time because there are certain deadlines to that. So if you haven't contacted your local fire department across the bay, definitely give that a try because you know every dollar you get reimbursed is worth it. So we've got another question here. Um, any recommendations for preventing looters in a fire ravage zones? And are there and are looting losses generally covered by insurance? Well, the looting you can you can board up and you can do fencing. That's something our company does we will be there the minute the fire line, the minute that a fire, um, the fire department leaves, we're there. That's so usually- we check, we check in with the incident commander in advance of the fire being put out. He will direct us where he wants protections, where he wants barriers, and he will give us the approval to put boarding on the structure. We have a unique system that we do for boarding such that a uh, vandal doesn't just take a screwdriver and take screws out of the exterior of the building. Ours bolts from the inside of the building so that it's very secure. And we can send that detail out to you folks, whether you want to install them yourselves or hire someone else. It's just a very good first measure because it could be even considered an attractive nuisance and they could blame you for allowing people to get on your property and get injured. Kevin? Yeah, and I can tell everyone that um, looting, which is theft, is a covered peril, one of the 20 covered perils under an HOA or individual homeowner's policy. So that's definitely something that's covered. Thank you. Um, in an HOA, when lower decks are wood and needing, needing to be replaced, reserve study mentions redwood, should another potential material be used and what might be a suggestion? So I don't think there's a problem with redwood. If you look in my PowerPoint presentation, what you can do is you can enclose the soffits and the fascias of that deck with fire resistant layers so that you're not inviting flame into that substructure. 
and you can get with, there are engineers that have fire resistant deck designs that use natural materials, but also have some supplemental protections and caulkings. For example, when you caulk your home, there's fire rated caulkings that can do two things. One is they can just hold the flames for up to two hours from penetrating gaps. And there's a second sort of caulking that's called intumescent. And when it gets hard or when it gets hot, it expands to up to 10 times its volume and it fills additional gaps in places where flame and, and airflow can go. So those details for those types of decks are available from both caulking manufacturers and deck builders. Thank you, Frank. Um, we've got another one here. Um, someone had, they had a fire inspector come out from the city and said, and the fire inspector said they were in compliance, but there was a couple homeowners that did not like that assessment and want more done. Um, any comments or feedback on how to navigate that type of situation? Well, as we have the same neighbors as you do. I wish we could get some help. <laughs> I was going to say as a board member, you know, it's hard to keep every homeowner happy and we have 214. Um, I know that this year we made a big effort. We spent a lot of money and, and our landscaping efforts have been applauded by 99% of the homeowners. Um, so I would just demonstrate to those individual homeowners that you've done everything you possibly can. The fire department has given their blessing. There's no better expert in the world than a fire inspector to come out and say that you're in compliance. Thank you so much for that. Um, so this one was from another Frank. Um, he said, any thoughts on closing air vents such as Vulcan? I'm not familiar with what Vulcan is, but I'm assuming that you might be. Absolutely, I think all vents, again, if you can make an automated system, they also make lead links on certain um, louvers that you can put on your outside air vents that once they reach a, certain, reach a certain temperature, they fail and the louvers close and there are fire rated dampers and there are smoke rated dampers. So yes, it's a premium cost, but I think being able to isolate your structure from airflow and intrusion by both smoke and ash is a great idea. I don't think you're allowed to by code put those on your eave vents but again, as shown in the drawing and mentioned, if you put certain screens on there, it will help keep any embers or heat trans or uh, fire transmission, but you still are gonna get a lot of heat and soot, and you'll probably get contamination of both those ceiling cavities or attics if you have them. So um, in case you guys haven't figured this out yet, um, Frank loves design build. Frank's happiest day of his life is when he finds out about a new product and he gets to share it, even if it's not something that we use. Um, I've listened to hours and hours and hours of design build stuff. So I know that if you email him which product works the best or who do you recommend, he'll figure it out for you. And um, that's, I mean, it's not something that we do. We don't do roofing, we don't do vents, but he knows. He's worked on all sorts of very weird jobs and weird things, and I could go on for half an hour. But if you have, if you call the office and get his email address, he will research and find out anything like that. And then he'll be super happy. <laughs> he'll do it on Sunday. <laughs> Regarding the, uh, the Vulcan rent uh, uh, vents question too, my wife and I had to install a new hot water heater and our city Nevada permit inspector said, you gotta have a vent up and you have to have a vent below because our water heater was in an individual shed. So I actually installed uh, two Vulcan vents and they look like honeycombs that you see in like a beehive, really, really small. And inside those honeycombs are little wire meshes that are less than two millimeters in width. Therefore, no ember can actually penetrate you know, the shed. So I highly recommend the Vulcan uh, vents. So thank you, Kevin. Um, I received a question via email. Um, uh, an attendee said their community borders a state reserve, so they are limited in what they can do with regard to zone clearances. Any suggestions for how to how other communities deal with this type of complication? Hmm. I honestly I haven't heard of that before. So I know in our in our association we we know exactly where our line ends and the public area begins. 
So we make sure we clear the brush and get rid of all the fuel that we can every year. Um, I've never come across that kind of a problem before, but again, I would probably try to get the local fire department involved because nobody wants wildfire. Nobody wants an urban fire. And I'm sure your fire inspector at your local fire department would be a very strong advocate you know, for that association to go back to some city official and say, well, we need to create defensible space around these homeowners. And, and do you really want to stand up and say we can't? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I have some experience with that, Kevin. Uh, if, you, if you communicate with whoever's responsible for that reserve uh, and make sure you give them uh, advanced warning in a letter that this is a potential problem they're going to, that they need to address. Uh, they should, and they usually have public meetings as well. So you can attend those meetings and make your concerns known. Uh, but the most important thing is to make sure that they understand that this is perceived as a problem and that it needs to be addressed. And they should do something about it. They should go in and put the, uh, the defensible border in, as you say. There's also uh, some trimming they can do to make sure that some of the trees don't catch fire and, and, and float into the, uh, to the adjacent neighborhood. Uh, it depends. They should be good neighbors, uh, and they need to do that. Thank you, Dave. Um, and thank you for that question. Um, so we have another one here. We'll, we have time for just a couple more. How can a flat top asphalt roof with with the small rock pebbles be made fire resistant? That'd be you, Frank. Yeah, I'm stumped on that one because uh, that is, sadly, that's the worst case scenario in a fire zone to try to put, you're going to have to replace it with a built up roof that's made of composite material that has fire resistance. You can't just cover up the rocks and the as and the bitumen and the existing asphalt that's there because it does not, there's no UL assembly rating that includes sandwiching that sort of a combustible material under something else. I would recommend budgeting eventually to be able to strip that off and put a very low slope metal roof on instead. That's just my first blush answer to that question. Hey Frank, a real quick follow-up too. Do we see asphalt shingle roofs everywhere, all over the place? If embers actually fall on top of those, would that cause a fire right through the asphalt or not? It depends on the age of the asphalt shingles. As they get old, the gravel deteriorates and washes off, and you have nothing left but asphalt, which is a petroleum-based material. And then underneath those shingles, you've got tar paper which is combustible, it's paper and it's tar. So if the very hot ember, if it's gonna sit there and burn like a coal, it could start a fire directly through an asphalt shingle roof, even a new one, but most likely it would be something that would be in the last third of its lifespan where most of the gravel would keep it from touching the asphalt directly while the wind cooled it or moved that ember somewhere else. Thank you. Great, thank now you, you so can, much, Frank. Oh, go ahead. You can <laughs> add layers of roofing on top of asphalt shingles and bury them where on a flat roof with the bitumen uh, roofing, you cannot. Thank you so much, Frank. So we are just about out of time. We have a couple slides just to get through after this. Um, just some quick updates, information about ECHO. So I wanna thank our speakers for joining us for the presentation and for this Q&A. Um, again, you can read, I'll slide back. If you have more questions, feel free to email Maria here at water, or Maria at waterdamagerecovery.net or feel free to contact me, Hannah McCauley, and I can pass along your questions. So and again, I wanna thank our sponsors for today's webinar, Fire and Water Damage Recovery, Farmers Insurance, Access Construction, and Levy Erlinger and Company. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure to be here and share information with all of your HOAs. Thank you, Frank. And just a couple um, things coming around, right around the corner, we have on October 27th, political rallies at your front door presented by Tim Flanagan. You can go ahead and register for that. Um, you'll find the link um, on our ECHO website to go ahead and register under events. Also coming up November 5th is the route to new rental restrictions. This is gonna be presented by Lori Poole and Alex Sohal. So that's gonna be a good one. Don't wanna miss out. 
And again, we had our, a very successful uh, 2020 HOA University and Expo. And if you haven't registered already, I encourage you to register. You can still view the entire event on demand. You can watch the presentations. You can see all the exhibitors booths and leave them a message. So we encourage you to um, register for the on-demand portion of our 2020 HOA University and Expo. And lastly, if you are not a member, um, we do offer the, uh, these webinars for free for non-members, but we have a lot of great um, resources and um, benefits of being a member of ECHO, and we encourage you to join, join our community. And you can contact Jacqueline Price at jprice at echo-ca.org or call our office, and we'd love to get you, get you on board, and um, that way you can have a wealth of information that you can share with your community. And we thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Tuesday for our next webinar. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks a lot for coming. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care now.